Alex is joining us from New Zealand. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. All right, let's see. My Hello, everybody. I, heard, I found out that I missed this most amazing wedding last night. But uh, had a wonderful time in the little town across the way. It was really wonderful. So I, uh, I'm sorry, Morgana and Devin, but I heard it was amazing. Um, so I want to um, just give you a little bit of a kind of an overview. So uh, that, and then I'll go into more detail. So I, I started the, um, the whole process of getting on the radio. I got into the publishing business and self-published a book. And um, I ended up being a guest on over oh, like 1,200 radio shows. I think it was about 1,500 by the time I was all said and done. And I ended up selling over um, a quarter of a million books. And so it was, and I want to walk you guys through that whole journey. So if it's something that, you know, you find of interest, you can follow in my footsteps. But before I get into that, I just want to give you a little bit of background about where I come from and how I ended up here. Anybody want to hear a little bit about that? All right. So um, I was born in uh, Los Angeles, East LA to be exact. Uh, cue the Cheech and Chong. Um, and, uh, I, uh, I grew up with, um, a very dysfunctional father. Anybody got any dysfunctional family members? Yes, yeah, so you can relate. Um, my, uh, it, it, my dad was so screwed up that I literally grew up living in cars and tents and boats and trailers and places like that. Um, this is a picture of my brother and I in a, uh, 1982 Datsun B210 that, the four of us, my mom and I, my brother and I, lived in over a couple-year period. Uh, this is a, a skeleton of a houseboat, what ultimately became a houseboat that I actually spent the better part of my childhood in. Uh, I don't know how this photo survived, because my mom destroyed all the other ones, uh, but it had no running water, no electricity, uh, no toilet. Oh, actually, there was a toilet. It was a porta potty no shower, no bathtub, and the worst part was the, uh, the walls got infested with river rats, and they had a nasty habit of dying in there. It was kind of gross. Um, and uh, I started my first business when I was eight years old simply because I was hungry, and uh, I made these things. They're uh, little hanging wind spinners, and I dug tin cans out of the trash, and I used that little knife and cut them and slid them and squashed them down. And I sold them door to door and I sold thousands of them. And, uh, my dad, he took all the money. So, uh, it got so bad when I was 12 years old that I, I took my brother and left and uh, fled to a boy's home. That's how that went down. And this was the last place that I lived before I did that. It was a little 18 foot travel trailer, which was, uh, a lot bigger than, uh, the car. And that little part up there outlined in red was my room for uh, about three and a half years. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a background about where I came from. And so um, when, we, uh, when, I, when my, and I took my brother and went to a boy's home, my mom escaped a couple of weeks later and finally got out of the situation. She turned up and there was a big court battle and uh, restraining orders and all kinds of other fun stuff. And we ended up moving to a place called Bakersfield. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's Bakersfield for you. And we lived on welfare and food stamps for the next couple of years. And I don't know what your opinion is of welfare and food stamps, but as a young teenager, I wasn't really keen on them. Uh, to me, it was kind of like they just had loser printed on them in big bold letters. And my mom always sent me to the grocery store on my bicycle to the grocery shopping. So, um, I took matters into my own hands. My mom didn't have much of, a, of an education or job experience, and so I just went out and started knocking on doors, and I got myself a half a dozen jobs and worked really hard, and I saved up enough money to buy my first car when I was 15 years old, and this is what it looked like, a 1979 Chevy Chevette. Don't laugh. It's all I could afford. <laughs> and uh, so that car uh, ended up making me a fortune in a way that I never expected. Because you see, what I did when I got that car is I went out and I got myself a couple of uh, delivery jobs and I became a courier driver. And I did that all through um, high school and on into college. And so when you're a courier driver, your job description can be summed up in four words. 
get it there fast. So I collected speeding tickets along the way. And um, they only allow you one ticket on your record uh, before they drop you because the insurance will cancel you. So I had to go to court and fight these tickets in order to keep my job. And I was fortunate enough that I had a couple of buddies who were cops. And uh, I called them up and I said, hey, do you guys have any tips for me on how to beat these tickets? And they were really helpful. And so I ended up beating eight out of ten speeding tickets over my courier driving career. And I noticed a couple of things when I was in traffic court. The first thing I noticed was I was the only one winning and everybody else was losing. And I also noticed that there was a lot of people in there. So I thought to myself, you know, I wonder uh, how big of a market there is for a little book on these little tricks that I've learned on how to beat speeding tickets. And I did a little bit of research and I found out that they write 100,000 traffic tickets in America every day. So you do the math. I started writing. And I worked in the tutelage of a, a gentleman some of you might uh, have heard of. He's no longer with us. His name's Dan Pointer. He wrote a book called The Self-Publishing Manual. He was my mentor, and he guided me through the whole process of self-publishing my book. I had moved to Santa Barbara by that point, and so he was a neighbor of mine in Santa Barbara. And uh, this was what my book looked like. Beat the Cops, The Guide to Fighting Your Traffic Ticket and Winning. And if it looks like it was produced in my garage, that's because it was. <laughs> So anyway, so I called Dan up after I, you know, had 3,000 copies sitting in my garage and all my credit cards mortgage except for one. And I said, this is great. Book's done. How do I sell it? You know, how do I get the word out? How do I get it out there? I certainly don't have a promotional budget. And he said, you know, why don't you try being a guest on radio shows? They're free. You don't have to travel anywhere. And um, I think that's probably your best way to go. And I said, great. How do you do that? And he said, well, why don't you start out by putting an ad in a magazine called Radio Television Interview Report? Some of you might have heard of it. It's no longer in publication. But what it was, and I'll show you here, this is what my ad, this is the, the, what, what it looked like, and uh, this is what my ad in it was. And it was mailed out to a couple of guys named Stephen Bill Harrison. Some of you might know who they are. Um, they published this magazine, and it was mailed out to about four or 5,000 radio and TV producers every couple of weeks. And you put an ad in it, and they would mail it out, and then these producers would look through the magazine, and if they liked your show pitch, they would call you and book you on your shows. So I did that, and I got 50 interviews from it. And 47 of those interviews generated three orders or less. And three of them generated over 200 orders each. And so me being the rocket scientist that I am, I said, hmm, those must have been big shows. Therefore, I want to focus my attention on getting on more big shows. And so I called Stephen Bill back and I said, do you guys have a database? I'm assuming you do because you mail your magazine out to them. Um, that has that I can follow up and I can pitch all these you know you know big shows and try to get on those and they said yeah we have it and I said great how am I going to be able to tell the big stations from the little stations because that's what I really want to do and so they said well by stations market rankings and by the stations wattage so they're kind of important I want to explain them to you so anyway I bought their database and I started working with it so the size of this uh, the, the stations market rankings are basically the size of the station are uh, the size of the city that the station broadcasts in. So New York's the number one country, or the number one um, market in the country, LA's number two, Chicago's number three, so on and so forth. So every single radio station that has a transmitter in the greater New York area gets to say it has a number one market ranking. That goes all the way from WABC with three million listeners down to the Polka station with not enough people to fill your garage. So the market rankings didn't tell me how many people were actually listening. They just told me that the station was broadcasting in a big city. So then I turned my attention to the um, station's wattage, which is how much power does this station have. And conventional wisdom and logic would lead you to believe that the bigger their signal, the more listeners they have, right? But it doesn't work that way, unfortunately, because what happens is the FCC, which gives out the wattage to the radio stations in America, doesn't give out very much wattage to stations in big cities. Because if they did, their signals would all bleed over into each other. You know you've been there. You're going on a radio dial, and it's just one station after another. And on the other hand, you go out into the prairies, they're happy to hand out 50,000 watts or 100,000 watts because they know they need that much power just to pull in a few listeners. So I worked with that for a while, and I said, okay, what I really need to do is I really need to find out the shows and the stations that have the most listeners. And I did a little more research, and I found out that there was a company called Arbitron. Some of you might have heard of them. Uh, and they did all the ratings for the radio stations. They've since been bought by Nielsen. 
And so I started calling Arbitron. Now, Arbitron's a big multinational company. And I started just making phone call after phone call after phone call. And I think after a couple of weeks, the operator finally got tired of me calling, and she finally put me through to somebody who could actually help me. And I had my spiel down, and this guy picks up the phone. And um, I uh, said, you know, I, my name's Alex. I wrote this little book on how to beat speeding tickets. I've got all these little radio stations calling me, and um, I just want to focus on the big ones, and I'm wondering if you can help me. And he said, well, Alex, he said, let me explain to you how we work here at Arbitron. We rate 256 markets across the country. We do it four times a year, and we sell our ratings to, for somewhere between five and $25,000 to each one of the stations within each one of those markets. And my little calculator brain is sitting here going, uh, I think that's like two or three million dollars for the whole country. So anyway, we went on talking for a little bit longer, and I said, look, I, I I can't afford to spend millions. I'm just a kid working out of my garage. Do you have any suggestions for me? What would you do if you were in my shoes? And he said, well, Alex, he says, I don't know how you got through to me, but you did. And he said, I happen to be the vice president of the company. And I'm like, go. <laughs> and uh, he said, and I said, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, I, 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 uh, I like your book. And he says, I have a few friends who could use a copy of it right about now. So I'll make you a deal. If you will send me a dozen copies of your book, I will send you the, my most, not my most recent, but my previous ratings book for the whole entire country. Now, that was it. And I'm like, really? You will? And he's like, yeah, because I've got my brand new one out, and that's the one I'm selling now. But for your purposes, the ratings don't change much in three months. And so that was a day that completely changed the course of my life forever. And sure enough, a couple days later, it arrived in the mail, and it looked like a telephone book. And I actually brought a copy of it because I want to show you guys what this looked like. Um, this is the uh, Arbitron Radio USA book. Literally looks like a telephone book. This particular issue is 914 pages long. And this was a gold mine for me. And after I stopped jumping up and down like a chicken with my head cut off, I sat down, and I went through this this book with a highlighter pen, and I picked out every single station in the country that had 100,000 listeners or more, and I started, started calling, getting myself booked on these shows left and right. I put a press kit together. I'll tell you guys about that and, and walk you through that process. And so um, the last time I um, did a count and sat down and figured it out, I'd been a guest on 1,264 radio shows. Um, if I would have had to pay for all that airtime, which I got for free, um, and, and you know, when I was doing these shows, I lived in Santa Barbara on the West Coast, and so a lot of the, the majority of the morning drive shows are in the central and eastern time zone, so I would do all these shows in the morning. So a lot of times I would do literally, you know, two, one, two, three shows every morning. A lot of times I was making ten, fifteen thousand dollars in book sales before I even got out of bed in the morning because all these interviews were done by telephone. And so if I would have had to pay for all that airtime, it would have cost me almost five million dollars. And ended up getting it for free and ended up selling one, $1. 1.5 million dollars worth of books, quarter million books, all from home and uh, all doing a garage produced book. So that's been my journey so far. So thank you. So how many of you would like to know kind of the process of what I went through and, and how I did that? Okay. So I want to share that with you. Before I do that, how many of you would like to know where I am now? Okay. So some of you already know where I am, so, but I want to show you some pictures. So about, um, uh, what was it, about almost five years ago, I achieved one of my lifelong dreams, and I moved to an island in the South Pacific. Um, any of you uh, fans of Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit? Yes. So I moved to the uh, South Pacific Island of New Zealand, a.k.a. Middle Earth. Um, New Zealand's gotten a little carried away with this Middle Earth thing. Um, and, and they, they, they paint the airplanes with it. And you come in and they stamp your passport, welcome to Middle Earth. And they've got uh, Middle Earth at the main gate at Auckland when you roll into the airport. It's pretty cool. Um, so um, anyway, this is my home today. I live at the northern tip of the South Island of New Zealand, a long way from that little Datsun B210. Um, this is what it looks like in the wintertime when there's snow on the mountains. It's just an incredibly beautiful place. I am extremely blessed to be there. And uh, the first, the couple questions that I get were, what happened to your brother and why New Zealand? So I want to answer those really quickly. So this is my brother and I. He, uh, 
I got him a job when he was 18 years old working for a company in Santa Barbara called Food Tools. He started out just sweeping the floors. They're a big company. They manufacture large-scale uh, food processing equipment, and they've got plants in China and France and all over the place. Anyway, he runs the company now. So he's, he's done well. And uh, why New Zealand? Because I love the outdoors. I love nature. I'm a big outdoorsman, and it was, it's just the most beautiful place on earth, and it's where I'd always wanted to be. So I had the opportunity to, to go and move, and so I did. Um, I love to hike. Uh, I love to climb. I like to fly. In fact, Dan Pointer's, uh, the guy who introduced me to Dan Pointer um, was a guy named Ken DeRussi. He taught uh, paragliding, parachuting. Some of the guys who know Dan Pointer, you know he was big into skydiving and parachuting. So he taught me how to fly, and I love to kayak, and uh, I love to off-road. Any off-road enthusiasts here in the room? Uh, nobody. No off-roaders? Oh, well. Anyway, that's my Toyota Land Cruiser BJ44. Love that thing. Um, so um, I share all of this with you, not to brag, well, maybe a little, um, but really more just to inspire you um, because um, I'm living my dream life. And a lot of you actually are on the track to that. And some of you are like, Vicky's already living her dream life. But I can tell you for me personally that radio made that possible for me. And it can make it possible. It can totally set it up for you as well. And I know that for a fact because I literally, over the past 20 years, I've helped over 10,000 people in 30 countries around the world follow in my footsteps, get booked on radio shows. Sell. My clients collectively have sold hundreds of millions of books and done billions in sales. So I know it can do that for you. And so everybody's got their own idea of what their ideal life is. And I'm telling you that as an author, radio is a really highly leveraged way to make it happen. It, can, it did it for me, and it can do it for you, too. So I see you have a question, and I will try to make some time to get to questions, but it might have to wait until afterwards. So, But I promise I will get to you. All right, so um, let's jump into a couple questions that people confront me with. And the first one, which is, uh, isn't radio dying? And, you know, in the age of all the new media, people say, well, radio is kind of an old-school media. Is it still working? Is it still strong? Does it still pull? And the answer is yes. And the two biggest radio interviews that I've ever seen actually happened in the last couple of years, March of this year and October of last year. And each one of them generated over $250,000 in sales each. And both of them were my clients and both of them are authors. So it, it is still pulling and it's pulling in a really big way. Um, podcasts are also booming and podcasts are kind of the next evolution of radio. As a matter of fact, um, I'll show this in just a second, but um, there's over 100 million Americans now regularly listening to podcasts. I myself am, am a huge podcast consumer. I love them, listen to them all the time. Um, and that's up from 60 million last year. So you're seeing a massive, dramatic spike in podcast listening audience. 3.3 billion downloads in 2015, up from 1.2 billion in 2012. So it is a rapidly uh, expanding arc. Um, most top podcasts are actually, the, all the big ones are live recorded radio shows and they simply record them and upload them to iTunes. So it's really that part of the audience has taken off. Now, the talk radio audience is up on, for some of the shows as much as 50% over the last year. Anybody got any ideas why it's had a big spike Love him or hate him, he's got everybody engaged, and they're paying attention, and they're specifically being drawn to media that gives them a voice and allows them to speak out and talk back and express their opinions. And so the media that are benefiting from this most are social media and talk radio because talk radio gives people a voice. They can call in and they can sound off, and we've seen some massive spikes in the numbers and that's why it's happening. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, oh, this is a, a testimonial from one of my clients. Her name is Robin Ryan. She wrote a book on uh, getting hired and getting jobs. She said, the secret to selling books is getting on radio shows and podcasts. I've appeared on over 1,500 of them. Uh, I depend on Alex for my list, and I've used his database tools and resources for over 13 years. My books have sold over 700,000 copies. Don't be fooled into wasting money and time elsewhere. Radio sells books and services, Robin Ryan. So I'll share a few more, few more testimonies with you later, but I just wanted to sh just throw that one in there now. Um, radio is an especially perfect media for authors. And uh, I want to go into some of the things about it. Um, 
First of all, it's got the biggest captive audience. There's 125 million commuters who are driving back and forth to work every single day. And radio is the only media that reaches them there. So when you're a guest on their favorite show, you own them. They are a totally captive audience. They don't click away and go someplace else. This is my favorite. Radio listeners all have jobs. They are all gainfully employed. Why? They're driving back and forth to work every day. No other media captures that demographic. These are people who are educated. These are people who have money, and these are people who read, and they can afford to buy your book and whatever else it is you have to offer. So it's a really highly targeted audience you're going after. This is what they look like. You guys have all seen one of these before, but that's the radio listening audience to really give you a visual. It's all these commuters driving back and forth to work, and it's not going to change, and it's not going to go away because the commute's not going away, and every other media is illegal when you're in your car. Radio is the only one that's legal. So... By comparison, I might be a little extreme with this, but that's a lot of your social media audience. Um, so uh, you get lots of time to talk. The average uh, interview on a radio show is 10 to 15 minutes on a music show and a minimum of a half an hour and sometimes up to as long as three hours on a talk show. So you really get time to talk about your book. Where other media and other forms of promotion, a lot of times you don't get time to really talk about it. Um, the interviews are free, which is really great. Um, and you don't have to worry about getting dressed up and getting stuck in traffic jams and going through TSA and spilling your coffee and whatever else. Um, and I, you can do radio interviews from any phone, anytime, anywhere. And I have literally done 95% of my radio interviews just like this. Now... While my little fly-in comes in, I want to take a moment and really let this picture sink in for you. So, here's Alex, at home, laying in bed, talking on the phone. And there's his audience, stuck in a traffic jam. Everybody raise your hand and say, I can do this. <laughs> yes. And he has done it many times. Right, Randy? <laughs> so anyway, oh, and we do have traffic jams in New Zealand, by the way. <laughs> That's for real. That really does happen. Anyway, so let's talk about the four ways to get radio interviews. Um, first of all, you can hire a PR firm, which is a great way to go if you have lots of money, like five to $10,000 a month, and you don't have any time on your hands. Other than that, I wouldn't recommend it. Generally, what happens when you hire a PR firm is they will book you on a bunch of dinky little shows because they're the easiest ones to get you on, and the only thing they guarantee you is a monthly bill. So I'm not a big fan of PR firms. Uh, you can advertise on sites that list guests. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there on the Internet. The same thing is going to happen to you. There's over 10,000 radio stations in America. That doesn't count all the podcasts. That doesn't count all the Internet shows. It doesn't count all the satellite shows. And the vast majority of them do not have enough listeners to fill your garage. So you really have to focus on the big ones. When you advertise on these sites, you're probably going to get a bunch of little shows, which is great in the beginning if you need some practice. But when you are ready to target the big ones, you really need to go after them. Um, third is you can send out a mass blast. You're going to get the same results. You can send out an email. You can go on their you know, Facebook, Twitter. You can contact them any way you want via blast. But again, the, most of the response you'll get will come from small shows and small audiences. And if you want to get booked on the big ones, you do what I do and what the big PR firms do, which is you call them and you pitch them directly yourself. Now, a lot of people think that um, calling is very old school. It is, and that's why it works. The other reason that it works is that radio is an auditory medium. And the most important thing to a radio host when they're thinking of booking you on their show or a podcast is they want to know what you sound like. And if they get to talk to you on the phone, they get to hear what you sound like. It's really pretty simple, but it takes down the number one barrier that they have to book you on their show if they get to hear your voice. Simple as that. Um, the other thing that they're interested in is what are you going to tell their audience? And that's what your press kit will convey to them, and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, all right, so here's the things you need to have in place before you get started. Just basically laying some foundation stuff for you. So you need a hot or controversial topic, a.k.a. a pitch or a hook. 
And um, so that's kind of the thing that gets you on the show, whatever your topic is about. What are you going to teach the audience? What are you going to share with them? Um, why should they stay tuned and listen to you and not go someplace else? Um, and I have a couple of pitch formulas. I have quite a collection of them, actually, that I use to kind of help with this process. And I'll just show you one of them here. So this is a formula. It says, is slash are your blank destroying your blank? Blank ways to stop them now. Um, so this are, I'm going to give you a couple examples of how you might use this formula to come up with a show pitch that will get you booked on radio shows. So are your doctors destroying your health? Three ways to stop them now. So if you are involved in any way, shape, or form in the health or healing arts or fields of any kind, this is a great show pitch that will get you booked on these shows. Um, here's another one. Are your children destroying your marriage? Five ways to stop them now. If you are a life coach or you're involved in relationship coaching or anything like that, um, this is a great pitch. We'll get you booked on shows. So you can see that no matter what your topic is, you can take it and plug it into that formula. And I have dozens and dozens of those formulas. And you can get them for free if you want. Uh, just go to my website at radiopublicity.com, put in your name and email address, and I'll send them to you. Um, so that's the first thing. You've got to have a good pitch. That's what the – besides sounding good – they want to have your, a good pitch from you. Next thing you want to have in place is a good, clear phone line. Uh, some people want to just do interviews from cell phones these days. Uh, they've got their landlines disconnected. I would recommend you uh, either keep your landline or reinstall it if you're really going to go into this because the sound quality is significantly better. Um, and radio people prefer to interview you via phone on a landline than a cell phone. They will do it on a cell phone, but it's kind of a second choice for them. Um, what's that? Um, they do do a lot of stuff on Skype, as long as you have a good, strong internet connection and you're not dropping out on Skype, and sometimes Skype does that. So landlines still their most pref preferred way to go. Um, the majority of the podcasts use Skype, though. Um, okay, so um, you want to have a way to record calls so you can go back and listen to your interviews later and critique yourself and have other people critique them. Um, I use a service called Audio Acrobat. This is my affiliate link. Um, it's $20 a month. So if you decide you want to sign up, I make a whopping $6. Um, but um, it's a good service, and I use it myself. And um, if you want to record your radio interviews, that's the thing that I've found that works the best for me. Um, the next thing is you need a current database of top radio shows. Mine is available. I'll tell you more about that later. And you need a press kit. You need both a physical press kit and an online press kit or a media page on your website. And I'm going to walk you through that and show you how to put that together. And before I do that, I just want to mention really quickly... And some people say to me, they say, well, Alex, you know, it's the digital age now. Why do I need a physical press kit? Can't I just put the media page up on my website and send them there? I will tell you why. So the first thing is all these big radio shows, after they get finished with their show, they usually take the next hour to hour and a half after they finish their show, and they sit around a little table, the producer and the assistant producer and the host and the co-host, and they just brainstorm. What are we doing on the show tomorrow? What are we doing on the show the next day? What are we doing on the show next week? And so if your stuff makes it to that little table so they can pass it around and say, what do you think of this and what do you think of that, your chances of getting booked on that show skyrocket over somebody who just sent in an email. Because we all know about email, right? Email deliverability is like 10%. So one in 10 chance they're even going to get it. Well, even if they get it, you got another 10% open rate. So now you're down to 1%. And then if they open it, how many of them are actually going to click on the link that goes to your media page and print something out to take it to their little roundtable meeting so they can brainstorm and book you? You're probably down to one-tenth of 1%. But if you send them a physical press kit and a copy of your book, well, you're going to make it to that table and you're going to get booked. And nobody does it anymore. People don't send out physical press kits in book anymore, so you'll stick out like a sore thumb and stand out from the crowd, and I promise you, you'll get booked. So if you take one piece of advice from me, get yourself a physical press kit and put it together and mail them out. It'll really help you get booked on shows. So here's what goes into it, and this is what mine looks like. So I put my book cover on the outside, and I mail these out in a hand-addressed envelope, and... Um, I always uh, write the words requested material and close down in the lower left-hand corner because I never send one of these out until I've actually called the producer and found out if they're interested. Um, and then um, I put a little sticker of, a con on the cop on, uh, of the cop on the outside, and, um, and I tell them. You know, when I get them on the phone and they say, yeah, why don't you go ahead and send me an email, I'll say, 
I'll send you an email, no problem. But I'm also, uh oh, I think that might have to be remedied here for just a second. And we want to um, help me put this back together. It's just the batteries just came out, so I can keep talking. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I think this one just goes back like on that side, and this one is over here. Anyway, um, so you want to send out – what I do when I get them on the phone is I, and they say send me an email. I say, great, I'll go ahead and send you an email, but I'm also going to send you a copy of my press kit and a copy of the book. And it's, it's going to come in a bright red envelope with a little sticker of a cop on the outside, so be sure to be on the lookout for it. So that's how I do it, and that's how I anchor it. Um, and uh, is it still working? I'm sorry I dropped that. I apologize. Um, and, um, and so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you inside the press kit. I'm going to show you what I put on the, in the contents. So um, the, fir the first and most important thing is what's called your one sheet. And your one sheet has at the top your pitch. So whatever your show pitch is going to be. So mine says X career driver beats eight of ten tickets. And you'll use those fill-in-the-blank show pitch formulas to come up with whatever your pitch is going to be. And then underneath that I have a headline that says, or a subheadline that says author of beat the cops tells your audience. Now remember, the only thing they care about is... What do you sound like, and what are you going to tell their audience and keep them engaged and not go someplace else? So I lay this out in a real simple bullet-pointed format. I tell them exactly what I'm going to tell their audience in a hook format so that they want to call me and book me on their show. And I'm going to zoom in, and I'm going to show you what that little bullet box says. And I do all this is on one sheet. I've got my bio over there. It's very short. And I throw in some statistics. Statistics are really helpful. Media people of all kinds love statistics. So, but in the most important thing is this bullet box and what I'm going to tell their audience. And I'll show you this. So, author Beat the Cops tells you how he beat six out of seven radar tickets. Now, I don't really think there's a lot of speeders here in the room, but anybody want to know how I beat six out of seven radar tickets? Oh, I got a couple people. Um, how it's possible to speed legally. Who wants to know how to do that? Okay, we got a couple of takers. The speed demon, you know, stunt lady over here. Um, uh, about an organization that will pay your speeding ticket fine. Who wants to know that? I mean, you got to have kids that get tickets, and you want to get them paid. How to beat your tickets without going to court. How about how to schedule your Charlie and the cops vacation? Usually they're on the phone calling me right then. I, dude, i got to know how to schedule my own Charlie and the cops vacation. So this is what you want to do. You want to create hooks that draw them in and make them want to call you and find out your information and what it is you have to share. So that's what you want to put on that one sheet because that's what's going to get you booked on shows. All right, now the other thing you want to put in your press kit is a list of sample questions. And basically what this is is a choreographed interview script. And I'm telling you, 90% of the radio hosts go right down this list of sample questions. And it's literally how I do radio interviews in my sleep. Um, and you might think that they're – and I just want to break the news to you. They don't have time to read your book. And I apologize. I know that might hurt some of your feelings. But they're really busy, and they just don't have time. And so what they look for is they look for cheat sheets. They look for shortcuts. And that's what this is for them. He says to them, oh, I don't have to do any work. He's already given me all the questions. I don't have to read the book. If you find a radio show that somebody that actually reads your book, I promise you, you have just found yourself a small show. The big shows just don't have time. And so they'll use these as sh shortcuts and cheat sheets. And they'll go right down, and this is how you basically get to choreograph your interview. And you get to you know, have them ask you the questions you want in the order you want them. Um, and every once in a while, they'll throw you a curveball, but generally they'll follow this because it's no work for them. All right, so now um, another thing that I include in my press kit is something I call a controversy sheet. This doesn't apply to everybody. Um, it applied to me. And if you are able to weave controversy into your topic, great. It can help you get booked on more shows, but you don't have to. Um, but in my case, I had some controversy, so I set up these little arguments between me and a cop because I observed that talk radio shows kind of like controversy. And so, you know, I've got a couple of examples over here I'll show you. Uh, my little guy says, cops have ticket quotas to fill. And, of course, the cop says, no, nah, ticket quotas were outlawed a long time ago, and they have no influence whatsoever on the number of tickets police write. Well, I can't tell you how many radio shows I've done on do cops have quotas. And, of course, you know, the, the, nice, the cool thing about radio is it's, a, it's an anonymous medium. So when I do this show, the guys that are all calling in are all these cops bitching about their quotas. And it gives them an opportunity to vent. And then, of course, at some point in time, the police chief calls in and says, no, we don't have quotas. Those were outlawed a long time ago. And then we hang up on the guy and say, thank you for your call, Mr. Police Chief. So, um, but it makes for fun radio. Um, another example, um, and you guys have all heard this, 
Um, the higher the speed, the higher the danger. That's what the cop's saying. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that speed kills? It's okay. I'm not going to pick on you. I promise. You can raise your hands. Okay. You, you, are, you are correct. Speed does kill. The faster you're going, the, the worse the accident's going to be. My guy says, actually, the safest speed on more, most roadways is currently 10 to 15 miles an hour faster than the speed limit. Now, that's actually true. And the reason why it's true is because if you're going with the flow of traffic, you're much less likely to get into an accident than if you're going against the flow of traffic. And if the flow of traffic is going faster than the speed limit, then that's the speed you should be going at if you want to be safe. Anyway, it makes for a fun argument. So um, these are all just controversies that you can open up. Now, some of you um, probably have things that are more along the lines of a soft and warm and fuzzy topic that just don't have controversy woven into them. And that's fine. You don't need to do controversy. However, I'm going to give you one quick example just to kind of, you know, inspire you a little bit. Um, a good friend of mine is a guy named Joel Roberts, and he did all the um, media training for Chicken Soup for the Soul. And so when he got Chicken Soup for the Pet Lover Soul, which is pretty soft and warm and fuzzy topic, um, he looked at it for a couple minutes, and he said, I got it. I got a really good pitch for this. And the question he asked was, do people love their pets too much? And so across the country goes Chicken Soup for the Pet Lover Soul doing their radio tour asking the question, do people love their pets too much? And you've got people calling in and you've got, grandma, uh, you, you, you've got this guy calling in going, you would not believe my grandma. She's got 16 cats. They go to kitty spas. They get hot rock treatments. It's out of control. And then, of course, you've got grandma calling in and she's going, yeah, but if it weren't for my 16 cats, I wouldn't even be here. So anyway, the point being, is that he managed to create controversy where there was no controversy. Um, and you can do it with soft topics. Don't have to, but you can, and it'll help you get booked on more shows. Um, now, also in your press kit, you want to include letters of recommendations and clippings. Now, these are really easy to get, and all you have to do is ask for them. So if you've been a, if you've been a guest on a show and you've done a good job, and you know, you'll know if you do, you just call the uh, producer back up after the show and say, hey, um, I know you're really busy, but could you put a couple sentences down on station letterhead saying I was a great guest? Um, so that's all you got to do, and they'll send you, and I've never had one of them say no, and they'll send you letters like this. Anybody heard of Rick Dees? Any, any Rick Dees people in the room? Okay. So this is a letter from his producer. It says, to whom it may concern, Alex Carroll was a recent guest on both our local Rick Dees in the morning show, Los Angeles, and our local uh, and our national weekly Top 40 broadcast. The phones went crazy. The listeners loved it. And I'd recommend Alex to anybody who was interested in a great in an interview. Now, does that speak louder than anything I'm ever going to be able to say? Absolutely. So you stuff like something like that in your press kit, and they're going to go, oh, he's, he's been recommended by somebody I know, one of my peers, and you'll get booked on shows. Um, this is one from WCBS in New York City. Here's one from KGO in San Francisco. I have dozens of these things. So you get them. You stick them in your press kit. You're not going to get the big stations in the very beginning, um, but you, you know, work your way up and continue stacking as you get more of them. Now, the other thing you want to do is you want to put clippings in your press kit. Now, clippings, uh, you want to get them from major media, online or offline, doesn't matter. Um, and the best way to do this is use Google Alerts. How many people are using Google Alerts? Okay, everybody should be using Google Alerts. So just go to google.com forward slash alerts and type in your topic, whatever your topic is. My topic was speeding tickets. So type in speeding tickets, and what will happen is every time there's a breaking news story on your topic, Google Alerts will send you the story. And so what this does is it gives you fodder for the media, and you get to you know, pick out these articles and go, look, USA Today is talking about speeding tickets, or uh, Money Magazine is talking about speeding tickets. You should be too. And, that, and they pay attention to that, so it helps you get booked on the shows. So um, that's an easy thing to do. gets you more coverage. It doesn't even matter if somebody else mentioned it in your article. You just you know, blank them out because you, you're the one that's pitching the show. It's, it's going to get you booked. All right, now let's talk about calling the producers and booking the interviews and the, and the seven-step process. So the first thing you're doing is you're going to call them on the phone, and you want to keep your pitch short. Um, 30 seconds is a really good target to go for. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to call the, the radio station, you're going to ask for the uh, producer, and the operator is going to put you through to their line. And nine times out of ten, you're going to get their voicemail. And when you get their voicemail, you just leave them a message, say, you know, hey, I've got a quick uh, show pitch for you. Um, here it is. Maybe send them, you know, give them the, uh, your website link if you want to send them there. And, um, and then you wait for a couple of days. Now, the reason you wait for a couple of days is because you want to give them the chance to call you back. Now, they're not going to call you back. Nine times, I mean, nine times out of ten, they're not. Occasionally, you might want to get a call back. But half the time, they don't even call Hollywood stars back. So don't expect a call. But you wait for a couple of days and give them a chance to, and then you follow up. And you call them again. And then the second time you call, 
you're going to get the operator who's going to put you back through their line, and nine times out of ten, you're going to get their voicemail. The second time, you do not leave them a message. Instead, you hit zero, and zero will take you back to the operator. And when the operator picks up, you just say, hey, I just got Bob's voicemail. Is there any chance you could page them for me? Simple as that. Now, some of you are thinking, gosh, aren't you going to piss these guys off by paging them at work? And the answer is no, and here's why. Because you are the answer to the number one problem they have that never goes away, which is what am I doing on my show tomorrow? What am I doing on the show next day? They need 10,000 guests a day to fill up their shows in America alone. So you're the solution to the problem that they have that never goes away. Now, here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to drone on. I guarantee you if they pick up the – so what you do when they pick up the phone, you just say, hey, I've got a quick show pitch for you. Do you have 30 seconds? That's all you have to say. You might want to write that down. I've got a quick show pitch for you. Do you have 30 seconds? I guarantee you they wouldn't have picked up the phone if they didn't have 30 seconds. Simple as that. So then you hit them with your show pitch, and they're either going to say, no, that's not something we're interested in, or, yeah, that sounds interesting. Send me an email. That's what they'll tell you. And then when they say send you an email, I'll say, great, I'll send you an email, and I'm also going to send you a press kit and a copy of the book, and it's going to come in whatever color envelope you've got, and be on the lookout for it. And that's what you do. It's that simple. It's not hard. And if they don't pick up the first time you have them paged, you just keep calling and have the operator page them until they pick up. All right, so that's how it works. And um, let's see. Then um, the next thing is uh, it's important is about getting your time slot. So once they've asked for your material and you send them your book and you send them your press kit and they've had a chance to look it over and you follow up with them, um, a lot of times they'll call you back and they'll say, okay, we're ready to book you. When are you available? And so this is really important because this is the, the, the breakdown of the listing audience. Um, this is what the graph looks like. So the red spike is morning drive and the yellow spike is afternoon drive. Um, so if you're pitching a morning drive show, and you want to write this down, you want to be on between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning. That's the sweet spot. There's five times as many people listening at that time slot as there is during the whole entire rest of the morning show. So 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning. If you're pitching an afternoon drive show, you want to be on between 5.15 and 6.15 in the afternoon. That's the sweet spot. You will literally get five times the response if you get in those two time slots. So how do you get that slot? Very simple. When the producer says, when are you available, let's say it's a morning show that you've pitched, you just simply say, I've got, two, I got, I've got an opening on Wednesday at 7.30 and on Thursday at 8 o'clock. Which one works best for you? And whichever one they pick doesn't matter because it's falling right in the sweet spot for you. All right? So um, next thing is you want to make sure you get the hotline number and the producer's cell phone. In case something comes up for you at the last minute, you want to make sure that you can get in touch with them. That's really important. And... I want to really stress building relationships. When I first started doing radio interviews, I had no idea that this was going to turn into this recurring thing that just happened over and over again. I thought, I'm just going to be a guest on these shows. It's going to be a one-time deal, and they're not going to have me back, and that's the end of it. But pretty soon, they started calling me back, and they're like, Alex, we want to have you back on the show. And I'm like, you do? And uh, they're like, yeah, you're a great guest. And I'm like, I don't have anything new. And they're like, no, 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 it was, you're great. And, and so I'm like, okay, fine. And so I'd do the show again, and I'd sell more books the second time than I did the first time. And I realized that the attention span of the average American is equal to that of a hummingbird. And so anyway, um, you know, some of these shows I've been on over the years, 5, 10, 15, 20 times. And, and, and when you start planting the seeds to be a repeat guest, you can really turn this into a machine. So it's really important to build relationships. And I just want to play a quick phone call for you. Um, this is from Rick Dees' producer. You saw his letter earlier. Just to illustrate the whole building relationships thing and what it has done for me. All right, so here we go. And, uh, oh, you have to promise not to laugh at this picture. It was taken of me when I – I looked like I was about 12 years old. It was actually my very first in-studio radio interview because Rick's show was in, down in Los Angeles, and I lived in Santa Barbara at the time, so it was like an hour away. So anyway, we're going to roll this and uh, have a listen. It's fun. And, uh, yes. Uh, sounds like our audio is not hooked up. It was hooked up earlier. We tested it. All right. Well, it's all good. We'll skip past it. Um, so your interview. Let's talk about how it should go. Um, the first thing that you want to do in your interview is you need to establish your credibility and why people should stay tuned and listen. And, and, and you want to take charge of your interview. 
And um, it's really important because a lot of people will get into a radio show and they'll just wait for the host to lead them around by the nose. And it's really important that you show up with an agenda and dance with them. If you wait for them to kind of lead you around by the nose, you're not doing the dance. And they really do like and love people who show up and literally be co-hosts with them. So that's a really important thing. Um, And in the introduction, you want to establish your credentials. And there's two types of credentials. There's experiential credentials, and there's letters behind your name credentials. Both of them are important, and believe it or not, the experiential credentials are even more important. So um, letters behind your name, you guys all know what those are. Doctor, you know, lawyer, founder of the XYZ Corporation, whatever, you know, you know, letters you've got. And those are great. But... What's even more important is your experience. And so for me, for example, I was not a a traffic court judge or a lawyer or a cop or any of those kinds of things that would have given me credentials. No, instead, I was a courier driver who actually beat 8 out of 10 tickets. In other words, I had firsthand experience with what I was talking about. And that gave me more weight and more credibility with the audience than anything else, any letters of my name behind my name ever could have. And that's true for all of you as well, and that is what gives you a connection point with the audience that's far more than just having a PhD or whatever it is you have behind your name. The I've been there and I've done that, and I feel your pain, and I can help you solve whatever problem you're in. So it's really important in the first 60 seconds of your interview that you tell people your story so they know, yeah, I can identify with this person. Um, so, and the second thing is you want to go into the, 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 the meat of the interview once you've established that. Now, this can be all kinds of things, but... Your, all your bullet points, everything that you're going to do, everything you're going to share with them, everything you want to teach them, everything you want to educate them, um, your you know jokes and anecdotes if you have any of those. And you want to do at least one of two things in the course of every interview. You want to either entertain or enlighten. Okay, So you want to teach people something or make them laugh. And if you can do both, that's the ideal scenario. You don't need to do both. You can just teach people something or you can just make them laugh. But if you can blend the two, you've accomplished the ultimate ideal interview. Um, If you want to get everything you can into soundbite formulas, which is basically 30 to 90 seconds because radio is constantly moving. There's um, traffic and weather and commercials and songs and constant breaks. So they love it if you can keep things nice and tight in what they call soundbite format. Um, And if you can refer to lists or charts or diagrams in the course of your interview that may be in your book or hopefully are in your book, that'll actually really help drive sales for you in response. And I'll give you a quick example. So uh, you might remember that on my one sheet, the very first question uh, that I had, the very first bullet point of what I was going to teach the audience is how I beat six out of seven radar tickets. Okay. So I want to, how many of you said you wanted to know that? I think a few of you raised your hands. Okay. So I'm going to tell you how I beat six out of seven radar tickets. So what I would do, wow, we've got the mood lighting going on now. So anyway, so um, the way I did it is I'd go down to the court where I was supposed to appear, and I would tell the clerk I wanted to file what they call a public records request. Um, And it sounds kind of complicated, but it's really not. It's very simple. And it's just one single piece of paper, and you can request all kinds of documents because they're public record. So you can ask for the officer's radar training certificate, calibration records for his radar gun, calibration records for his tuning forks, his agency's FCC license to use radar, the traffic and engineering survey, and the list goes on. There's like a dozen things you can ask for. Now, you don't care if any of this stuff turns up. As a matter of fact, it usually at least one of them turns up either out of date, inaccurate, doesn't exist, or falls through the cracks because they don't have all their paperwork together. Case dismissed. You win by default because they just don't have their ducks in a row. So that's how I beat six out of seven radar tickets. Now, so let's just say you have a radar ticket and you're driving in your car on the way to work and you just heard me say that. What do you have to do? You have to buy the book because I just rattled off a whole list of things that you got to go down and file this public records request to get. And there's no possible way you could have written them down as fast as I rattled them off. And not only that, I told you the list did what? It went on, right? And I said, there's like a dozen things you can ask for. So you have to buy the book. Well, every one of you can use the same strategy. And it's the way that you can, you know, motivate people to buy your book without coming across as an obnoxious salesperson. 
So it doesn't matter what your topic is. You know, you have the top 10 secrets to blah, 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 fill in the blank. And the host asks you, well, what are the top 10 secrets to blah, blah, blah? I'm so glad you asked. We don't have time to cover all 10, but let me give you the top five, right? And then what do people have to do? They got to buy your book to get the rest of them. So that's how you want to do it. You don't dodge the question. You answer the question. You say there's more. And that's the way you give a great interview and you make everybody happy, and you still get to drive response and traffic to your site or to Amazon or to the iBook store or wherever you're sending people. Um, all right, so that's the beginning, of the meat of the interview. Now, um, the end of the interview is the close, and this happens. The, pro, the host will come on when you get to the interview, and they'll say, thank you so much for being a guest on our show. Uh, we loved having you. You were great. Um, how do people get in touch with you? What do you want to promote? What are you plugging? What are you selling? That's, they'll come in and do that which is different than most media because most, most media won't do that. But radio people are really cool about that. Um, so what I say, and you, know, you might tweak this a bit for your application, but I say, well, the best way to get the book is directly from the publisher. Well, that happens to be me. I don't tell them that. Um, and for everybody out there who's listening, when they mention your show when they place their order, they get a, a really cool freebie along with their book. They get a free list of speed traps for whatever state they live in. Because I have them for all 50 states and all the provinces in Canada. Anyway, I got it all covered. And, um, and so I, I tell them that, and this is what it looks like. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you where I got that in a second. Um, and then I give out the website. I say the website is cleandrivingrecord.com. That's where people can go. And we're having a contest there. And the person who submits the best ticket story or excuse every week wins a free copy of the book. So if you have a good story excuse, you might want to go there and submit your story. Plus, you can also sign up to receive the winning ticket story or excuse every week. And who doesn't want to do that? Because it will help you beat your ticket. Um, and then the last thing that I do is I say, if I'm anywhere near Christmas time, I'll, I'll end the interview by saying, and these books make great stocking stuffers for anybody you know who has a gas pedal in their car. So... Um, Anyway, so that's the close. Now, the couple of most important things I want to draw your attention to are the freebie with purchase. In other words, my free list of speed traps. So what I did to, to get that, and lists make the best ones, um, is I called the people up at speedtrap.org, and I said, tell you guys what. I'm on tons and tons of radio shows. I can drive massive amounts of traffic to your website. Um, all I want to do is just give away one page list of your speed traps for each state, and then at the bottom, I'll put your website to drive people there to get the rest of them. And they're like, absolutely, knock yourself out. Well, my sales, my response to my radio interviews tripled overnight the minute I did that. Now, here's the other reason that that's important. How many of you are sending people to Amazon or the iBookstore or to bookstores in general to buy your books? Who's doing that? Quite a few of you. So here's what you're missing out on. You're missing out on having their contact information, aren't you? And isn't that huge, right? Don't you want all the people who've bought your book on your mailing list? Isn't that like really, really important? Well, all you need is a freebie because you say, I don't care where you go to buy the book. Just email me the receipt, right? And I'll send you the freebie. And the receipt's going to have all their information on it. And boom, you've got them all in, their, in your contact database. So it's really, really important and really powerful for that purpose. All right. Um, and the other thing is um, you've got to give people a reason to give you their email address. I'm sure you've all heard this before. But uh, that's all part of building your database and building your client list. So uh, something that's a really you know, valuable freebie. Mine was a, con a combination of a contest and also being able to sign up and receive the winning ticket story excuse every week. And everybody signed up for that. So that's how I was able to build my list. Because people don't always buy from you the first time. A lot of times they just come to check you out. But if you capture their name and email address, then you can start building a relationship with them over time. And eventually once they get to know you and trust you, then they'll buy from you. So anyway, that's how that works. And those are the important things. And radio is a phenomenal, incredibly highly leveraged tool for building lists. I mean, you can go out and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on Facebook ads and all kinds of other internet marketing. Or you can go get on one big radio show and get 10,000 people on your list in a day. And I'm not kidding. It totally happens. It happens to my clients all the time. It's really powerful, and it's free. So you want to balloon your list really quickly? Start doing radio shows um, and podcasts. Same difference. All right, so uh, I want to show you. This is what my newer book was, uh, Speeding Excuses That Work. And this was, came from that contest that I had. So all those people that sent in their best ex stories or excuses, I got thousands of people submitted stories. So I finally looked at this, and I went, there's another book here. 
And so I took a month and I compiled all the best ones. And my friend Mark Victor Hansen calls this chicken soup for the speeder soul. So um, anyway, so that's that. And the last thing I want to share with you is after every interview, you want to send out a thank you letter. It's really important. And most people do not do this. But this will help you really stand out from the crowd. And the other thing that it'll do for you is it'll help you start the process of being a repeat and return guest and starting this whole ball rolling of this never-ending publicity gold mine of being on these shows time and time again. So the first thing I say in my thank you letter is, you know, thank you for, uh, you know, having me as a guest on your show. I look forward to returning again in the near future. Um, so I'm planting that seed immediately. The next thing I say is if you ever need an emergency guest and somebody cancels on you at the last minute, Here's my cell phone number. Feel free to call me anytime you want, and I will pinch hit for you. They love that, and I've got, had lots of shows that called me just because they needed somebody at the last minute, and they knew I was a good guest, and I would fill in for them. The last thing that I do in that thank you letter is I say, and by the way, if you guys happen to be members of one of those stations and that um, or one of those bulletin boards or um, uh, prep services – that um, share guest information, I'd love it if you would post something about me. And there's a couple of these out there. And the biggest one's called Bitboard. Um, there's a number of other ones, um, Radio Online, Radio Star, and a lot, number of other prep services. You guys are kind of familiar, I would imagine, with masterminding. Have you heard of, you kind of know what that is? So this is kind of like a mastermind group for radio hosts. And they do it online because they're scattered all over the country and all over the world. And so they're members of these things and these bulletin boards. And after every show, the ones who are members will go in and they'll log into these boards and they'll post. They'll say, you know, we did this today. It was really funny. Like they have a good bit or a good show. Um, and then they'll also say, you know, we had this person on as a guest. They did a great job. We loved them. Or they'll say we had this person on as a guest and they sucked. Whatever you do, don't call them. So, you know, you, that, that's, it's a double-edged sword. You can't buy advertising on these. You can't get access to them. But the very first time I got posted on one of these, and it was Bitboard, I started getting phone calls one morning. And I got five phone calls in about 20 minutes from radio stations that I had not pitched who were calling me saying, we just want to book you. And after about 20 minutes and five phone calls, I finally asked them, I said, how did you hear about me? And they said, oh, we saw you up on Bitboard. And I'm like, Bit What? And so they explained me what it was, and I'm like, well, how did I get there? And they said, oh, Bob and Spike at KISW posted you. And I'm like, oh, I just did a show with them a couple of days ago, and it was really good, and I sold a couple hundred books. Well, over the next three days, 50, five zero stations called me from that one little posting from Bob and Spike at KISW in Seattle and booked me on their shows without asking for anything. No press kit, no book, no nothing. They're just like, you were on Bob and Spike's show. We know them. They're great. They loved you. We want you. When are you available? And so over the course of my whole radio interview career, after I started asking to be posted on these bulletin boards, they'd start posting me over and over and over and over again. And so I've got more interviews as a result of being posted on these bulletin boards and masterminds than calling and pitching the shows myself. It's that highly leveraged. So really important to do that and talk about that and say that and ask for that in your thank you letter. All right, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about my resources that I have available for you, my database. Um, if you'd like to follow in my footsteps and, and get booked on the radio, would you guys like to hear about that? Okay. So, um, so this is um, – the database is a total of 1,364 radio shows. They come right out of that Arbitron book that I sh shared with you over there. And the cutoff point, like I mentioned to you earlier, is 100,000 listeners. So there's no shows in my database that have less than 100,000 listeners. So you're getting just the big shows, the cream of the crop. Um, there's the, they're on the top 306 stations in America. They're sorted into 21 different categories. I'm going to show you what those categories are in just a second. And they come complete with the show descriptions. And when I do the show descriptions, I, I'll, I'll tell you, like, uh, you know, the type of interviews they like to do, guests they like to have. If it's a political show, I'll tell you whether they lean right, left, or center. Um, sometimes I'll give you biographical uh, background information. Um, and then um, the names of the hosts, the names of the producers, uh, the name, all the contact info, and I'm actually going to show you the database here in just a second so you can see all the contact info, um, the exact audience numbers, 
Um, and then I include the database in two different formats. It comes on the USB drive. But um, I use Excel. It's a very you know, common, ubiquitous spreadsheet program. Um, but if you have a different program that you like to use, uh, like Actor Access or Goldmine, like a spreadsheet or a database program, I also include it in a tab-delimited text format so you can import it to, into whatever program you want. Um, so here's, uh, here's kind of what the database looks like, just to give you a snapshot. It's much wider than this. The data fields continue off to the, uh, to the right. Um, but there's the phone numbers, the websites of the stations, the time slots when they're on the air. And so you, that's important to you because you want to call them and pitch them about 15 minutes after they've gone off the air. So this tells you when they're on, and that'll give you, you know, your target time slot to call them and get a hold of them. There's the names of the hosts, the names of the producers, their Twitters, um, their show emails. Um, and um, the show emails also include the, the emails for the hosts and producers. Um, the, the descriptions of the shows, the, the notes and their topics. Um, the category, whether it's news or variety, and I'll show you a bunch of other categories in a second. Um, whether it's syndicated or not, the call letters for the station, the total number of listeners, and they're in hundreds of thousands. So you see up there at the top, uh, 1010 wins. That's in New York City, says 34.3 in the listeners column. That means 3,430,000 listeners, and it kind of goes on down from there. Um, the frequency, where they are on the dial, uh, the band, the format, the address, and contact information con continues off onto the right. So that's just a snapshot of what it looks like. Um, now, here's the 21 categories that it's broken up into. Uh, general interest is the biggest one. Approximately half of the shows in the database are general interest shows. And what that means is they will pretty much take any topic you throw at them because they're you know, doing stuff that's of interest to the general audience. Now, the other half of the shows are broken up into all these more specialty categories like health, automotive, legal gardening, home improvement, money and business, and so on and so forth. Now, First of all, all of us can pitch the general interest shows. And so that's what I recommend everybody start with. And once you've gone through all the general interest shows, then what you do is you turn your attention to the specialty shows and you start tweaking your pitch a little bit so you can niche it to their topic. And I'm going to use myself as an example so you know what I'm talking about. So I get on the automotive shows, believe it or not, because I have a book on speeding tickets, and you get speeding tickets when you're in your car. And a lot of these automotive shows, guys get sick and tired of talking about, you know, mufflers and, you know, tune-ups and whatever. And they want to talk about something a little sexier, like how to be a speeding ticket, and they have me on as a guest. I get on the legal shows, because beating a speeding ticket is a legal thing. You have to go to court to make it happen. Um, I get on the money and business shows. Why? I mean, you wouldn't think that, right? Speeding tickets on a money and business show? But what am I doing? I'm saving people money. I'm saving them a lot of money because there's the fine on the ticket and the insurance surcharges. So I get booked on those a lot. I also get booked on the sports shows. Now, why would a speeding ticket guy get on sports shows? Because the people who listen to sports shows are guys who drive fast cars and get tickets, right? Um, I get on the travel shows a lot. Why? Because when you're traveling and you're on vacation, you get a speeding ticket. What do you do? Right? So there's a lot of ways you can tweak and fit into a lot of these specialty categories if you get creative. So those are the categories the database is broken up into. Now, in addition to the database, I also give you every other tool that you could possibly need to succeed at this, and I'll walk you through those here. First one is an actual physical copy of my press kit. And what I want you to do is use this as a template. This gives you something to model after and something to copy. And um, it's got everything in there, the one sheet, the sample questions, the controversy sheet. It's all there, the envelope, the whole bit, um, so that you actually can use it and, and model it. Next thing is a copy of my radio publicity manual. It's 200 pages long. It's everything that I've learned over the past 15 years of being a guest on almost 1,500 radio shows. I've shared probably a quarter of what's in this manual with you today. Now, this is the blueprint to my whole entire program. So when you get it, I want you to start by reading this first, cover to cover. It's really important. It's going to guide you through it. It's very dense. You'll probably want to read it twice, um, and it'll really give you the whole soup to nuts overview of every little detail of what you're going to need to know to really capitalize on this and take advantage of it. Uh, the next thing is you get a 60-minute audio of my interviews. So you get to hear me on the radio being interviewed. You get to hear me in action, listen to how I handle listener calls. Um, how do I dodge questions I don't want to answer? And you will get them. Um, and how do you, you know, do the closes? You'll get to listen to how I do that dance. So you're going to learn a lot just by listening to me do shows, and that's what this is. Um, you're going to get a bonus packet, which includes installation instructions. That helps you just get the database installed and navigate around it. 
um, you get a sample copy of my thank you letter. I want every one of you to copy that verbatim. Literally, don't change a word except just put your name on it because it's really effective and has worked really well. And you get a radio demographic profile. It tells you who listens to what formats based on their, uh, you know, their age group um, and um, just so you can determine which radio demographic target is best for your topic. That's what that's helpful for. Um, you get a free database update. I do these every six months. You do not have to get it six months from now. It's up to you whenever you want to cash it in. So how many of you are not done with your book or haven't even started your book? Let me see a show of hands, okay? So a few of you. So what this allows you to do is this allows you to get started and integrate all of the material into the actual creation of your book. Your book is actually going to be more marketable knowing this stuff ahead of time and integrate it into your book. And then once you get it done, you can cash in your free database update. Maybe it's six months from now. Maybe it's a year from now. Maybe it's two years from now. I've had people call me a decade later and say, Alex, I got way behind Morgana. Perfect example. How long ago did you buy my product? How many years ago was it? 2010s. It was, yeah, you do need an update. So it was seven years ago. And she hasn't cashed in her free update yet, but she gets one. Um, so anyway, that's how that works. So when you're ready, you, you're ready to roll. That's how it works. Um, and you get a 30-minute personal uh, phone consultation. Now, you can do whatever you want with that. Um, a lot of my clients use that time to talk to me about what their pitch is going to be or have me look at their press kit. But you can you know, pick my brain about any part of the campaign you want. And you get my complete collection of fill-in-the-blank show pitch formulas. I showed you one of them earlier. I have, I think, 43 of them all together. And those are really helpful because when you're coming up with your show pitch, you can go through all those fill-in-the-blank show pitch formulas and plug in your topic to all of them and then figure out which one is the best. And sometimes with your 30-minute uh, phone consult with me, you can send me those, and I'll go through and I'll pick out and I'll tell you, yeah, that's your best and strongest pitch or hook. And sometimes I'll tweak them a little bit for you and come up with something even better for you. Um, so that's those are really powerful and helpful. Um, the last piece of the program um, is what I call my master's course. And what this is, is this is 18 hours. It's on uh, USB and MP3 files. So you can listen to it on your iPhone or, you know, whatever your device is. And this is you getting to listen to me do this for real. So uh, this started out because people were literally calling me saying, Alex, we want to come hang out at your house and listen to you do this and watch you do this. I didn't really want people coming to my house. So instead what I did was I recorded one of my interview blitzes that I did uh, going into a Christmas time. And I booked 77 radio shows in three and a half weeks. And I recorded everything. And then what I did is I went back and I took out, and it takes me an average of five to seven phone calls to book myself on a radio show. So then when I went back is I took all those calls and I put them in order. And so you hear call number one, call number two, call number three, call number four. And in between each one of the calls, my commentary, I jump in and I say, this is why I said what I said. This is why the producer said what they said. I will literally teach you the language of radio. And it is a different language. They have their own lingo, just like everybody does. And this is incredibly valuable for two reasons. Reason number one is if you are pitching yourself, there's no substitute for learning how to do it than listening to me do it. There's nobody, nobody at this that I know in the world is better at it than me. And you get to listen. These are the real phone calls to these actual big radio shows, and you get to hear it being done. Now, that's great if you're training yourself, but it's also great if you want to train someone else. How many of you would like to just do the interviews and not have to worry about doing any of the calls and bookings? Let's see a show of hands. Yeah. Most of my clients fall into that category. So here's what I suggest you do and what a lot of my clients do. You take these recordings and you get yourself some, an in-house person to do them for you, and, and you use this to train them and teach them. Now, the best way to do this is how many of you who raised your hands Know of somebody that's in your fan base. Maybe they're in your Facebook list. Maybe they're in your family who's passionate about your topic and what you do that would like to help you and maybe needs a little extra money. Any show of hands? Exactly. That's your person. That's who you want. And you pay them 10 to $15 an hour or whatever you feel is fair, and you give them a bonus. And you say, I'm going to give you $25 or $50 for every radio show you book me on. And then you use my recordings. It'll take them a couple weeks to go through and listen to all of them. And when they're done, they will know more about how to book radio shows than anybody at a PR firm. 
I'm telling you that. I have PR firms that use these recordings to train their employees. They're that good and that powerful. Well, you can do the same. And you can train your own person, and they'll cost you a fraction of what a PR firm would cost you. Okay? So that's what makes them incredibly valuable. And then the beautiful thing is your person is only working for you. They're not working for a bunch of other people like they would at a PR firm. And they're only booking you on big shows because they're working with my database, which is only big shows. Whereas if you hire a PR firm, they're just going to be booking you on a bunch of dinky little shows. And you're going to be wasting your time and money for the most part. So it's a really highly leveraged way to go. So that's all the resources that are in there. And um, so what I have done is, oh, I wanted to mention this to you. When someone else is pitching you because they're not getting to hear your voice, you need to make sure that you have either an audio or a video of you up on your media page on your website so that your person who's calling on your behalf can send the producer or the host there so they can hear you in action. It's very simple, like a little two-minute clip. It can be audio. It can be video. Anything you've done, an interview, or you can just do some kind of thing yourself, it's not a big deal, but that's, you need to have that up there. Okay, so, um, so what I've done, oh, I want to read, um, let me ask, I haven't seen any, um, how, how am I doing on time, Vicki? How's my time? I'm, okay, may I share a few testimonials with you? Would you guys like to hear? Okay, so you guys have probably heard of the, the Stephen Covey and uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So they've been using my program for the last 15 years and, and credit the majority of their success to their radio interview campaigns. And they've sold 25 million books. Um, some of you might, anybody heard of Patricia Bragg? Anybody ever been into health food stores? Bragg's looking at me. Anyway, she's a big author. She's got tons of books, and she's been doing radio interviews for the majority of her life. She's been using my program for the last 20 years, and she's one of those people. She's got a, she has two people in her office that all they do around the clock is just book her on radio shows. She sold 100 million books, and radio is her prime favorite way to go. Um, you guys all know the Chicken Soup guys. They've been using my program forever. They'll tell you radio interviews are what got them going and launched them. Um, they've sold 500 million copies. I read you Ryan's, uh, Robin's testimonial earlier. She sold 700,000 books. Uh, this, uh, any, any sex people in here? Sadie does sex books. She's sold, uh, what has she done? Uh, she sold 2 million books and she's been on hundreds of radio shows. I helped her get started from the very beginning. Um, John Asraf, you've probably heard of him. He's been, uh, using my program for the last 15 years. This is, uh, Australia's all-time, uh, best-selling self-published author. Um, she sold 3.5 million books on radio. Anybody heard of Dave Chilton, the wealthy barber? Yeah, he sold 7 million books. He actually it's made so much money selling books, he was selected to be one of the dragons on Dragon's Den, which is Canada's version of Shark Tank. He literally made $20 million that he got to use and invest in. Anyway, he's been using my program for the last 15 years, and he'll tell you that it's one of the big reasons he got launched and sold 7 million copies. Um, and uh, this lady wrote a book on how to talk to angels and, and, and talk to your baby before it's born. She's uh, done 300 radio shows, sold 170,000 books. Pat Wyman does special needs learning books and education books. She's been on 300 radio shows, sold 50,000 copies of her books. Patrick Snow did a book called Creating Your Own Destiny, 350 radio shows, sold a million copies of his book. Um, you guys have probably heard of T. Harvecker, yeah? So his uh, 5 million copies of Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, he loves radio. And I was going to play you a video of, of him, but I don't think that's probably going to roll because the audio on that other thing didn't roll earlier, so we'll skip past that. So anyway, oh, does he have it up? Oh, he does, but there's no audio. <laughs> All right, well, we'll skip past that. We can go back. Um, so who wants to stay home, lay in bed, and make millions selling books? All right, so here's my special offer um, for um, Vicky's people. So my radio program, program's a $2,000 value, and the special I'm offering you is nine ninety seven. dollars um, If you'd like to take advantage of it, raise your hand. I will give you an order form, and, uh, and I would just want to say thank you. Uh, it's been lovely meeting each of you. haven't met all of you yet. If I haven't met you, come see me, say hi. And uh, Vicki, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. So um, go ahead and raise your hands if you'd like a, an order form. And um, Karen, would you do me a favor? Because I can't really access everybody. Um, if you want to help me, if there's anybody in the back of the audience that wants one, that would be great. So go ahead and raise your hands if you'd like one of my order forms. And I will, I will hand them to you. Who would like one? Here we go. And anybody else up here in the front one? There we go. There you are. 
All right, so have everybody up here. Anybody back there? I think Karen will grab you. Just raise your hand if you want one, and Karen will grab it for you. So, all right. Oh. There you are. You're welcome. All right, so um, let's just go ahead and fill these out. We're going to do a, a break. I'll just be outside the door, so yes, Randy? You have a complaint. That you, that you had to retire? <laughs> well, that's a, good, that's, that's, a good, that's a good complaint to have. Yeah, Randy's, I think you've uh, got my program, I think, about five years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's, it's awesome, so thank you. Anyway, uh, if you, uh, um, anybody else wants an order form, just raise your hand. Karen will grab one for you. Thank you so much. We're going to take a break. I think Vicky's going to come up and say words. I'll be just outside the door at the little table out there, so come and see me. Come say hi. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Alex. Don't miss a chance to meet him out in the front. And we are going to take um, a half an hour break. So be back at 4.30 because the IPI Awards will start. We have three more people that are going to be sharing how to develop your legacy, how to develop the job or the career of your dreams, and uh, just some amazing things, and how to really develop connection with people. It's your currency to success. So we will see you at 4.30. And be sure to be here promptly because we're giving away a drawing that is worth almost $14,000.